So not talking about meaning, we just have this complex differential equation. And we're just trying to think about solving this symbolically, just like we had before. Find yc prime and yc double prime and substitute. Assuming that the chain rule still works here, you're going to get an extra factor of 5i each time. So you'll get the derivative will be 5i a e to the 5i t. And the second derivative will be multiplied by 5i again. You get negative 25, right? i squared is negative 1 a e to the 5i t. Substitute. So do yc double prime plus 3yc prime plus 2yc into the differential equation. Negative 25. It's easy to make a mistake here. So I, I think it's good to show each step and not try to go too fast. So there's y double prime, then 3 times y prime. Forgot my prime there. 3 times this is plus 15 i a e to the i times the 5 i t. And then plus two times the original function, two times this is two times a e to the five i t. Now factor out the common factor of a and the common factor of e to the five i t. What's left over is going to be a complex number. Real part, the part that doesn't involve the i will be two minus 25, negative 23. And imaginary part is 15, that gets multiplied by the i. That look good so far to people, get that? Set this equal to the right-hand side now, just like usual. Whose coefficient is one. Coefficient doesn't have to be one, by the way. Could have been two or three, I'd wanna set if it were two, for example, I'd want to set this product equal to two, but it's one, so set it equal to one. And that means A is going to be one divided by negative 23 plus 15i. That is what A equals, but it's not in the standard form B plus CI. So you need to do this trick of multiplying by one and the form of one has a numerator and denominator that is the complex conjugate of this number negative 23 plus 15i, which is negative 23 minus 15i. And the magic of multiplying by a complex conjugate on the bottom there is that the, the imaginary part's gonna go away. The i's will go away. When you FOIL, first of all, 23 squared, negative 23 squared is positive 529. The outside and inside terms from FOILing cancel. That's why we do it this way. Negative 23 times negative 15i is positive 345i. And then 15i times negative 23 is negative 345i. Those cancel. Last times last is 15i times negative 15i, negative 225i squared, but i squared is negative one. So you get plus 225. Simplify a little bit more and, and break it into a real part and imaginary part. Negative 23 over, what is the sum? 754. And then minus 15 over 754 i. Okay, so there we have solved for a value of a, if there's no mistakes, that will make this function be a complex solution of this differential equation that's got a complex forcing function. But what does it mean? What, what does it mean for real life? Well, just as with eigenvalues and eigenvectors, when we had complex eigenvalues and complex eigenvectors, taking real and imaginary parts is the way to go. If we want to relate this to a real differential equation with a real forcing function that is either cosine of 5t or sine of 5t. Usually we do the cosine example, what I do in the lectures, it's what the book mostly does, but realize you could also do the sine example. So same left-hand side, same mass, same spring constant, same damping constant. 
But let's now make the, the forcing function be cosine of 5t. So now we're back in reality. That cosine of 5t by Euler's identity is the real part of e to the i times 5t. R e stands for a real part. Right, because this thing by Euler's identity is cos 5t plus i sine 5t. This forcing function is the real part of this complex forcing function, which was our original complex forcing function up here. And what I'm saying is these things are related. I'm saying ultimately that the real part of this function, where a is this, is going to be a solution of this differential equation, a particular solution of yp. If this had been a sine of 5t, sine of 5t would be the imaginary part of e to the i 5t. And the imaginary part of this function, when a is a solution, would be the real answer to this for yp. Imaginary parts are real numbers. They're just neck to the i when you've got a complex number. This imaginary part is a real number. It's just next to the i. The imaginary part of this is sine 5t with no i. So, but that begs the question, what is going to be the real part of this solution? Evidently, I need to plug this thing in there for a, and I need to use Euler's identity again. Let's go ahead and do that. It's not the most pleasant thing in the world, but it's also not as hard as it feels at first. So yp is going to be the real part of yc. That'll be the real part of a, which is negative 23 over 754 minus 15 over 754 i times e to the i times 5t. I'll just go ahead and use Euler's identity right away here. Cos 5t plus i sine 5t. And to figure out the real part of that product, you actually do not have to figure out the entire product. You don't have to foil it. You have to just do F and L, right? First times first and last times last are the ones that are going to multiply to not give you any, any i when you use the fact that i squared is negative 1. If we were after the imaginary part, because this was a sine 5t, then we'd have to do O and I from FOIL, outside times outside and inside times inside. But remember, in the end, the answer still would not involve an I. You just are after the quantity that's next to the I. But we're after the real part, so we just do F and L. First times first, negative 23 over 754, Cos 5t, last times last, careful. I squared is negative one, so that's actually going to give you a positive 15 over 754 sine 5t. <clears throat> is it possible we could have gotten this answer for this differential equation without using complex numbers? Yes, it is possible. You would just guess something times cos 5t plus something else times sine 5t and find the somethings. And you'd solve and you'd find these two somethings. So what's the benefit of complex? Um, one benefit is it does allow you to solve really two differential equations at once. The case where you have forcing function that's cos 5t, you take the real part and get this. And the case where it's sine of 5t, you would take the imaginary part and get something different. So it does allow you to solve yp for yp for two different equations with just one function yc. That's one benefit. Second benefit is not so clear until you um, work with this stuff enough. And that's the fact that working with exponentials even when they involve imaginary numbers is easier than trying to 
deal with trigonometric identities all the time. Maybe you encountered this in electronics a little bit. Um, when you're talking about, what is it called? It? Impedance, right? The, the impedance complex number sort of encodes information about both resistance and something else, I forget. Somebody remember? I think it encodes information about resistance and something else. Capacitance maybe, I'm not sure. Likewise, this complex number encodes information about this function that's not so obvious. What does it encode? It encodes its amplitude and its phase. What do I mean by that? I claim this function here, this real function, because the frequencies of the cosine and the sine are the same, can be written as some constant A, an amplitude, times cosine of 5t plus some number, call it B, a quote unquote angle, though it's not an angle yet. This B has nothing to do with flows, by the way. It's just a number. The claim is that the value of capital A is the magnitude of the complex number little a. In other words, it's distance to the origin in the complex plane. If you draw this number in the complex plane, well, first of all, because it's real and imaginary parts are close to zero, this is gonna be close to zero. The amplitude here is not gonna be very big. What is the complex plane? It's a plane whose axes are labeled real and imaginary. But you know, those are just labels. This is just a way of visualizing things. And when you plot a complex number in the complex plane, you plot this complex number as if its coordinates are these two numbers, these two real and imaginary parts. Say right about there, negative 23 over 754 minus 15 over 754i. The coordinates, the rectangular coordinates of that point would have would be negative 23 over 754 and negative 15 over 754. And so the magnitude of A is its distance to the origin. You can use the Pythagorean theorem for that. The phi there here is an angle, an actual angle, and it's you actually want to think of it as a negative angle here. It's going to be a negative number. We can say that tangent of phi, well, okay. Phi is the angle of A. Um, in complex analysis, which is the theory of complex numbers and complex functions, it's also called the argument of A and sometimes written arg A. You don't need to know that, but that's just FYI. Argument of A. It does satisfy the equation that tangent of B turns out using trigonometry is gonna be the imaginary part of A divided by the real part of A as long as you're not dividing by zero. So um, this equation doesn't work if A is on the imaginary axis, if it's pure imaginary. But if A is on the imaginary axis, you can just see what the angle is. If it's up here, the angle is pi over two. If it's down here, the angle is negative pi over two. But to find what phi is using the inverse tangent function, you have to think about the range of the inverse tangent function. We can say it's inverse tangent of the imaginary part of A divided by the real part of A, but because this particular angle you can see from the picture is in the um, third quadrant over here. And the inverse tangent function only gives you outputs between negative pi over two and positive pi over two, between negative 90 degrees and positive 90 degrees. 
you actually have to subtract pi from this. That's because the angle's in the third quadrant. If the angle had been in the first or fourth quadrant, you would not have to subtract pi. And actually for these problems, phi always ends up being negative for these problems. So it's actually always in the, the third or fourth quadrant. If it's in the third qua uh, fourth quadrant, don't subtract pi. If it's in the third quadrant, do subtract pi. Because again, this is gonna, when you do this, for this value of A, this ratio is actually gonna be positive because the two negative signs are gonna cancel. And the inverse tangent will give you an output in the first quadrant. So you have to subtract pi from it to get to the third quadrant. Yeah, for this example, it's inverse tangent of this number divided by that number. The two negative signs cancel. The 754s cancel actually as well. You get inverse tangent of 15 divided by 23 and then minus pi in radians. So for this example, that angle is, make sure I'm in radian mode here, inverse tangent of 15 20 thirds minus pi minus 180 degrees is negative 2.564 radians in degrees multiplied by 180 over pi will be about negative 147 degrees. Still haven't told you what the significance of all this is. What's well, related to this. What is capital A here? With the Pythagorean theorem, it's the square root of negative 23 over 754 squared plus negative 15 over 754 squared. And you'll be able to write that as something over the square root of 754 squared. So if we write it as something over 754, uh, 23 squared, already done this calculation actually, right? 23 squared plus 15 squared, that's the, um, Wait a minute, I'm feeling confused about something. Oh, it, it is going to be the square root of 754 on the top. I was thinking it was not going to be. Same as 1 over square root of 754, if you prefer. Anyway, this is a small number. It's about 0 0.036. The claim is, the ultimate claim is that yp equals this when a is approximately that and phi is approximately this. And why is that a good thing to know? Well, especially before technology, it would help you graph it. It would help you graph yp because you could say, hey, I know the amplitude and I know I've got a certain horizontal shift of the cosine function. So the benefit before technology is it helps you graph it. Is there a benefit after technology? Um, it's, I guess you could say it's still good to know the amplitude and phase. Let's see if we believe it when looking at the picture here. Mathematica. So I'm gonna plot the original function here. Negative 23 over 754 cosine of 5t plus 15 over 754 sine of 5t, t goes from zero to say two pi. That's gonna go through um, more than one period though, right? If I go to zero to two pi. So the amplitude, remember, 
was supposed to be about 0 0.0364. Does that look right? Yep. Amplitude. Notice this does look like a sinusoidal wave, even though it's a combination of cosines and sines, a linear combination. Ultimately, because the frequencies of the cosine and sine are the same, it can be written as just a plain cosine wave with an amplitude close to 0 0.036 and a phase angle close to negative 2.564. What is that? How does that relate to the horizontal shift? It's a little tricky. Um, <clears throat> if you plug in negative 2.564 here, A times cosine of 5t minus 2.564. And then if you factor a 5 out, then you can more clearly see what the horizontal shift is. Factor of 5 out of 2.564 means take 2.564 and divide by 5, leaving you with a minus 0.5128. And that means the horizontal shift from an ordinary cosine wave should be about 0.5128. Do we see that? Cosine wave starts at the peak when t is zero. This is a rightward shift. The first value of the peak there is when t is close to 0.5128. 0.5128 is the approximate t coordinate of this point right there, a rightward shift for the cosine value. What's the practical significance of all this? <clears throat> the practical significance is that YP is really the long-term behavior of this forced harmonic oscillator, of this damped forced harmonic oscillator. Because there's damping, because B is positive, solutions will go to zero as T goes to infinity. Right, we're not finding the general solution here. We're just finding a particular solution. All this work is for just a particular solution. I have not considered the associated homogeneous equation, unforced equation. I have not found YH here. But if I did find YH, it would have exponential decay in it because the damping is positive. So all solutions of the form YH plus YP approach YP as T goes to infinity. YP does not go to zero as t goes to infinity. So yp is really the true steady state behavior in the long term for this particular harmonic oscillator. And they, and they call it that, they call it a steady state. It's not an equilibrium, it's not constant, but it is a steady state. So if you've got this kind of external forcing for this kind of harmonic oscillator, after the exponential decay has caused yh to go close enough to zero that you can't observe it anymore, the only thing left you have to observe is yp. YP is what you observe in the long run. And it's completely determined by its amplitude and its phase. Make sense? Section 4.4 goes into a really deep analysis on this stuff. And you will be getting into that section. Um, some graphs that end, end up being really important for analyzing this are in section 4.4. Uh, these kinds of graphs. This one's showing you how the amplitude of the forced response, the YP, depends on the forcing frequency, omega. And you get some pretty interesting behavior there's a sharp peak here. For certain values of omega, you're going to have a very large amplitude force response. That's significant. Okay. This is related to glasses shattering when somebody sings at the right note. And if they sing with a loud enough amplitude. And you also see graphs like this that give you information about the phase angle as a function of omega as well. All related to the amount of damping, too. So it's really section 4.4 that is the ultimate main point of all this. 
but this stuff right here today is 4.2. So a little bit on the 4.3 in the lecture as well. But let's also spend a little time with something else here today before you work. Let's quickly do our ordinary calculations with this particular matrix. 5, negative 10, 4, negative 7. Okay, so let's get to the things we typically do as fast as possible. The trace is negative two determinants negative 35 minus negative 40 is positive five so the characteristic polynomial remember it's minus the trace times lambda so you get a plus two lambda plus five set that equal to zero to solve for the eigenvalues we're going to need the quadratic formula here because this is going to involve complex eigenvalues Square root of negative 16 is going to be 4i. 4i divided by 2 is going to be 2i. So our complex eigenvalues are negative 1 plus or minus 2i. Let's go ahead and find a complex eigenvector for negative 1 plus 2i. Okay, this could be a path toward our general solution. Or there's identity is going to be necessary. But I'm going to do something different after we find the complex eigenvector in this case. You can think about the entire matrix A minus lambda I, but you can also just think about the first row because the equations, if you do it right, are going to be redundant. First row is going to be, have a five minus lambda times I, five minus in parentheses, negative one plus two I that gets multiplied by X. And then the second, Entry being negative 10, nothing gets done to that. So you just get a minus 10y equals zero. I'm thinking about this equation here in my mind. I'm thinking about its first row. This simplifies to um, six minus two i. So if I wanna think of y as a free variable and x as a non-free variable, I could solve for x and get x equals 10 over 6 minus 2i times y. Maybe it's better to do it the other way around. y equals 6 minus 2i over 10 times x or 3 minus i over 5 times x. And my complex eigenvector v is going to be, if I take x to be 1, thinking of x as the free variable now, y will be three-fifths minus one-fifth i. So complex eigenvalue corresponding complex eigenvector. What we've usually done at this point is we've usually multiplied e to this power times t times the vector with Euler's identity and figured out the real and imaginary parts that are real quantities and written our general solution as a linear combination of those. But what I'm going to do today is something different. Why? Because it's related to linear algebra. I'm going to take this complex eigenvector and separate it into real and imaginary parts like this. Oh, this should be a one here. And I'm going to create a P matrix, change of variables matrix. Whose first column, hmm, what should we do? Maybe we should take the, the real and imaginary parts like we usually do and, and just hope some sort of magic happens here. Maybe I should try that for P and see what happens. Actually, I could have avoided fractions too. I could have multiplied both of these by five. Maybe I will do that. Let's do that instead. Five, three for the first column and zero and negative one for the second column, just so we can avoid fractions. There though, P inverse will not avoid fractions. So I guess I can't, I haven't completely avoided it. <clears throat> what, what, are we us, what are we usually doing when we're doing the P matrix recently? Usually the goal here has been to essentially change coordinates. 
so that the new system in the new coordinates is completely uncoupled, has a diagonal matrix when the matrix is diagonalizable. But we've only talked about diagonalizability with real eigenvalues. For example, when you've got distinct real eigenvalues, the matrix will be diagonalizable. When they're not distinct, maybe it is, maybe it's not. But what about if there's complex eigenvalues and eigenvectors? Will this still produce something useful when I compute P inverse AP? What is P inverse here? Using the shortcut formula like usual here. Yeah, I can't avoid fractions. P inverse looks like it's one fifth, three fifths for the first column and zero and negative one for the second column. Does that look right? I think that's right. Let's see what happens when you compute P inverse AP. When A is diagonalizable, this is going to be a diagonal matrix, but is A diagonalizable? Here we got complex eigenvalues. What in the world? What would, what's going to happen here? It's not clear. Let's just see what happens. P inverse AP. I'll do the A times P first. Okay, upper left entry, five times five minus 30. 25 minus 30 is negative five. Upper right will be zero plus 10. Lower left will be 20 minus 21. Lower right will be zero plus seven. Now multiply those. Upper left will get negative one plus zero is negative one. Upper right, one fifth times 10 is two plus zero is two. Lower left will be negative three plus one is negative two. Lower right will be six minus seven is negative one. It was not a diagonal matrix. So what does this mean? Well, even though it's not a diagonal matrix, it is a matrix that's got some symmetry to it. Is that an accident? No, in fact, look at those numbers, one, negative one and two, plus or minus two. Hey, real and imaginary parts of the eigenvalues. It's not an accident, that had to happen actually. So while it's not diagonal, the entries are the real part of the eigenvalues, negative one, and the imaginary parts, plus or minus two, for our two eigenvalues. And it's not a symmetric matrix. It's transpose doesn't equal itself, but it is, it does have symmetry in a sense. It is, you might say, kind of a nice matrix, maybe a matrix that got enough structure to it that maybe powers of it are easy to compute and maybe, maybe it's matrix exponential is easy to compute, maybe. Maybe, maybe not. Turns out it is easy. Well, easy is a relative word. Easier than that one. Because it turns out this matrix, I'm not gonna get into details why, because I wanna let you work in a couple minutes here. Turns out this matrix is related to rotation matrices. Matrices that are linear transformations that rotate. I'm not going to get into why because it just would take too long. And because of that, because the matrix is related to a rotation, that means it turns out its powers are easy to compute. You can find a, a fairly simple pattern for its powers. And you can also therefore find a fairly simple pattern for, pattern for its matrix exponential, it turns out, without getting into details. But in the end, we in the lectures, I call this C instead of D, because it's not diagonal. It's not complex either. Why did I pick C? I, I, I don't know, I was out of letters, so I pick C. It does remind me that it's related to a matrix with complex eigenvalues. And it, if you think about it here for 30 seconds, 
it had to be something non-diagonal because what are the coordinate changes all about? The coordinate change stuff is all about skewed coordinate systems where the axes are parallel to your straight line solutions. But matrices without with complex eigenvalues don't have straight line solutions. Origin would be a spiral sink here. There are no straight line solutions. So there, there's no clear axes to choose for the coordinate change, at least not parallel to any straight line solutions because there are none. But it turns out there is still a coordinate change that makes the, the matrix nicer. Okay, that's big picture. All right, you've got uh, 23 minutes to work.